200 p.m. off the coast of California International Airspace. Suddenly, two unidentified signals appeared on the radar screen flying straight into U.S. sovereign airspace at a speed of over 600 miles per hour. They did not transmit identification signals and did not respond to communication signals. This was a sophisticated incursion aimed at testing the red line and the response time of the world's most advanced air defense system. With less than 15 minutes before they could reach land, did the multi-billion dollar interception chain have any weaknesses? The Southern California Sea is not a random stretch of water. It is the home turf and primary training area of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. It is the maritime corridor leading to the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, two of the world's busiest commercial gateways, where billions of dollars worth of goods flow daily. Inside the Combat Information Center of the USS Jack H. Lucas, an early generation Arleigh Burke Flight III destroyer, a cold, tense concentration prevails. No alarms, no chaos, only professional silence punctuated by the steady beep of the system. 2.05 p.m. On the main radar screen, two unfamiliar signals suddenly appear. They are the only meaningful things on the control panel. Two unidentified signals appear on the radar screen vector 09 euro speed. 600 knots distance, 190 miles. No identification code, no communication response. They are entering the air defense identification zone. The presence of a state-of-the-art Flight 3 warship here is precisely why the two drones appeared. Their objective is not a destructive attack. They are tasked with conducting high-level electronic intelligence ELINT collection. By executing a carefully calculated provocation flight, the adversary forces the Jack H. Lucas to activate its entire defense chain. Immediately, the Aegis Baseline 10 combat system processes the data. The SPY-6 radar locks onto the two targets, and data on their range speed, altitude, and radar cross-section is transmitted at the speed of light. In microseconds, Aegis calculates the optimal intercept trajectory, classifies the threat level, and designates the weapon. The kill chain is activated. A gentle voice sounded through Teo's headphones from the ship's captain. Teo Bridge Command Center, you have tactical command. Rules of engagement are clear. Activate defense protocols. You are authorized to use weapons. At 2.07 p.m., the first layer of defense in this multi-tiered defense system was not close-range weapons. It was the standard Missile 6, the United States supersonic interceptor missile with a maximum speed of Mach 3.5. Teo designated the lead drone, attack target 1 with SM-6. On the foredeck of the Jack H. Lucas, the hatch of the Mark 41 vertical launch system slides open. There is no dramatic counting. It launches the 19-foot-long weapon skyward on a white plume of smoke. The SM-6 is not just a missile, it is a technological marvel. It is flying toward a point in space where Aegis predicts the drone will appear. But as the distance narrowed, the SM-6 underwent a transformation. It activated the ship's active search radar. It was no longer being guided, it was now hunting on its own. The target drone had no idea it was about to be attacked. There was no warning signal, no sign that death was approaching at 3.5 times the speed of sound. At a distance of just a few miles, the SM-6's radar locks onto the target, and then it plows straight into the drone, creating a terrifying explosion. In the Combat Information Center, CIC, the red icon representing the drone on the screen flashes one last time and then goes dark. The target has been completely destroyed. Target 1 eliminated the weapons officer reported in a steady voice. But the red alert continued to flash on the screen. The second drone was still there, and it just realized it was being hunted. The second drone abruptly changed course, descended, and began evasive maneuvers. It had just passed the effective range of the SM-6. Responsibility was immediately transferred, the next layer of defense ready for combat. Now it was time for the SM-2 to take its position ready to destroy the second target. The SM-2 needed support from the AN spy radar. The ship's radar would lock onto and illuminate the target with a continuous beam of energy. The seeker on the SM-2 missile will track the radar energy reflected from that target to rush in and destroy it. With a speed exceeding Mach 3.5 and an effective range of up to 170 kilomanistas, it is a seasoned veteran. As the drone maneuvers and evades SPY-6 locks onto the target using a dedicated fire control illuminator, the tactical action officer Teo gives the order, engage target high with SM-2 missiles, conduct a salvo launch. The two windows of this vertical launch system open. Two SM-2 missiles are launched in quick succession. The first missile forces the target to react, expending energy in an emergency evasive maneuver. The second missile is quickly launched shortly thereafter, attacking the target while it is in a state of severe energy loss. The drone's computer, however, advanced, now faced a situation it could not resolve. 
If it turned to avoid the first missile, it would fly straight into the path of the second. From the drone's perspective, it was a race it accepted it would lose. The high explosive fragmentation warhead of the leading SM-2 missile detected the target and detonated. The second missile, arriving a fraction of a second later, flies through the cloud of debris and fragments from the target and also explodes. It is exactly 2.20 p.m. Both targets have been completely neutralized. The missile's mission is complete. In the Combat Information Center, CIC, the second red icon disappears completely from the screen. This meant that both targets had been neutralized. The missile's mission was complete. Warning new vampire, approaching fast southeast direction, extremely close range. The Aegis radar screen, which had just been cleared of threats, now showed a third bright red dot. It was not coming from as high an altitude as the previous two. This third drone had executed a spectacular deception. It flew close to the sea surface, hiding at an altitude difficult for radar to detect, and only appeared once it had penetrated the ship's danger zone less than 15 miles away. An unimaginable position, a surprise attack aimed at bypassing the long-range defenses. There was no time for complex tactical calculations. The contingency plan was immediately activated. This was no longer a test. It was a battle for survival. Activate Tier 3. Launch ESSM. The order came almost instantly. From the vertical launch tubes VLS, it wasn't the giant SM-2 monsters, but a series of four enhanced Sea Sparrow missiles ESSM that shot up into the sky. Reaching speeds of up to Mach 4 in just a few seconds, they sped away. The third drone, though agile, could not escape the active seekers of the four missiles closing in from all directions. But this enemy was more stubborn than expected. One of the ESSM missiles detonated near the target, causing the drone to stagger but still coast by inertia toward the ship. It had breached Layer 3. This was Layer 4, the final steel wall. It was the Close-In Weapon System CIWS. It was an independent unit with its own search and tracking radar, along with a 20mm M61 Vulcan rotary cannon, the same type of rotary cannon used on fighter jets. This was the final line of defense. Those in the Combat Information Center don't even need to take action. The CIWS system set to automatic fire mode will detect threats using its own Kuban radar. The distinctive engine noise roared like a mechanical beast, and 4,500 tungsten bullets formed an impenetrable wall of fire. The drone now, just a hurtling mass of metal, is torn into hundreds of fragments that fall into the sea, just a few hundred meters from the ship's side. The final steel wall allows no gaps. It is the physical embodiment of the word no. Back in the real world, inside the Combat Information Center of the USS Jack H. Lucas, the screens remained clear. Four layers of defense were ready, but only two were needed. The entire engagement from initial detection to neutralizing the second target unfolded in under five minutes. Two advanced threats, stealthy and high speed, were systematically dismantled with cold, ruthless efficiency. There was no battle. It was a surgical procedure executed with technological precision. But the mission was not over. Destroying the drones was only half the story. The other half was answering the most important question who sent them. This was when the U.S. Navy shifted from defense to intelligence gathering. This was the electronic countermeasure. Before being destroyed, the drones were undoubtedly transmitting data back to their controllers. Telemetry data, the radar signals, they observed their operational status. The ANSLQ-32V7 system, known as CWIP Block 3, is designed to detect, identify, and locate hostile signal sources. It recorded the final data streams from the drones. Now, electronic warfare specialists and intelligence analysts begin their work. They analyze these signals, studying their frequencies, modulation, and encoding. They are searching for a trace, a unique electronic signature that can be traced back to the military technology of a specific country. The data they collect will be sent via secure satellite link to the National Security Agency and the Office of Naval Intelligence. The electronic ghosts of the drones will be analyzed and their origins identified. A message has been received, but a much stronger message is about to be sent. The physical destruction of the drones is a tactical statement. Successfully analyzing their data streams is a strategic statement. It sends a message to the unnamed enemy. Not only can we counter your best technology, we can trace it back to your doorstep. You cannot operate in the shadows. We will find you. 2.30 p.m. The operation ends and the Pacific returns to calm. For the crew of the USS Jack H. Lucas, it is confirmation of the success of their training and technology. No hesitation, no confusion, only quiet professionalism, the calm of a job perfectly done. The operation turned an act of enemy provocation into a comprehensive show of force. 
It told any potential adversary, think carefully. If you attack, you will fail. You will be exposed. And for us, it was just practice. On that day off the coast of California, there was no international crisis. No shots were fired in the evening news. Only a silent but powerful statement was made through the silent language of radar signals and missile interception. It was a statement of sovereignty and an unshakable determination to defend it. The lesson of 2025 clearly demonstrated was this. In the new era of asymmetric warfare and high technology, the speed of information and the precision of the kill chain will always outpace the stealth capabilities of the enemy. The confrontation was decided not only by powerful missiles, but also by the integrated systems that guided them. It is a victory for the machines and for the steady, professional hands that control them. All glory belongs to the crew of DDG-125. Their vigilance and skill transformed a complex, modern war machine into a perfect, impenetrable shield. For them, it was not a historic event. It was just another day on duty.